I think the decay would have been much faster had it not been for all these wonderful organizations, uh, you know, putting up a, a really formidable fight. Does public interest litigation actually work? I posed this question to Daniel Iloff, an attorney, on a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David Ansara. What follows is a short extract from a longer conversation. You can watch the full-length interview by clicking on the link in the description below. Enjoy. But you know, I think to your earlier point, judges, they are operating within uh, an ideological milieu. Uh, they are, uh, you know, often in South Africa, we'll see reference to transformation, and the imperatives therein. Uh, but there's no mention of transformation in the Constitution. Uh, that's what Chris Malan, I think his name is, I would refer to as transformania. That is this kind of political force uh, that has basically made that a kind of a political norm or a cultural norm in the country. Um, and judges are kind of uh, operating within that, that context. Yeah, I mean, Professor Malan, I, I, he actually makes this point, which is, I think, similar to the one I made earlier, where he says that, our bench and judiciary, they're good on certain issues, but it's just so that they do that so that there's a wiggle room to sort of make these other atrocious judgments. He is a bit more pessimistic than I am. But um, so, so, yeah, I mean, he he quite actively says that um, they, they, they'll they give on the sort of bit easier issues so that there's, yeah, they can, they can achieve what they want. But I mean, even, even with for example, one of my the cases that I really, really despise, a constitutional court judgment, is the public protector case, where the court basically, it was in that entire debacle about Tuli Madonzela's report regarding Kandla, where uh, she said, well, my my report is, is binding, my findings are binding, and Zuma must pay back the money. And uh, they went to court, went all the way to constitutional court, and the constitutional court said, yes, well, we agree. We're going to extend the powers of the public protector to make their findings binding. Now, a lot of people at the time praised that. They're like, yeah, it's great, awesome. Now, to, you know, the public protector can do this. But little did they just think, you know, literally a year in advance when Tuli Maranzela's term came to an end that we, we're not going to have a Tuli Maranzela forever. And now you have the situation where public protector has these expanded powers, much to, yeah, I think, you know, the big regret of Sarah Ramaphosa at the moment. But, um, and mm -hmm. and so it, it often happens where even cases where the majority of South Africa feels this is a good case or a good judgment, that when you actually just think about the practicalities and the consequences of the judgment, they aren't good. Um, but but at least with those cases, you can argue they just, they got it wrong, right? They, it, it's not because of politics, um that they they got it wrong i i don't know why they got it wrong to be honest it, it's quite strange to me i think the the sort of the the zeitgeist at the time was just you know so anti-zuma the entire country you know we had these big marches against zuma and i just think the sort of the tide was they were just riding the momentum um but yeah to this day i don't know why they made that silly judgment well, I think it's a good lesson because even if your team is winning in terms of the outcome of that judgment, you might create unintended consequences in the system that might come back to bite you. And it's one of the criticisms of the constitution itself that it was yes. designed for a Mandela, but what yes. we got was a Jacob Zuma. Um, yes. And, you know, I think another classic example of that is the appointment of the national director of public prosecutions who leads mm -hmm. the national prosecuting authority. That's a presidential power. And during the Zuma years, you know, uh, he just appointed uh, somebody who was from the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Exactly. So, uh, you know, you kind of need these checks and balances in the legal architecture, but I also think you need a, a political culture that values accountability, that stresses the importance of transparency. Um, yes. And that's what civil society organizations, such as the ones you represent, uh, are, are so good at achieving. So, yes. So Daniel, are you winning? Are you, are you uh, <laughs> achieving what you are setting out to achieve? Do you think you're pushing back the tide against some yes, of this well, I mean, state meddling? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the question is what what is success, right? Or, or what are your goals and what do you want to achieve? I mean, for for example, so I was involved in the like you mentioned earlier, the kill the Boer case, and to, again, I mean that that's a horrible case to to lose especially when with these type of cases you know they're often difficult and often you know i, I always advise clients you know litigation is 50 50 but often in public interest litigation the you know it's more like 
40, 60 in, in the favor of the state, right? You, you aren't on equal footing because um, just of the nature of the cases that you're bringing. But um, there are cases where you just know, you know, this is going to be a tough case. And if we win, it, you know, it's highly unlikely. Um, but you sort of go in with that expectation. So one of those cases was the Cuba case, right? The the Cuba donation case, we from the start knew this was a difficult case. And I was a bit surprised when we were successful. I mean, we're obviously prepared to be successful, but you, you get a feeling, you know, sitting there in court, listening to the arguments, listening to what the judge says, you get a feeling of which direction the case is going. And with the Malema case, I was really under the impression that we'll be successful at least in the most biggest part of what we were seeking. And I think perhaps I was blind because I was, I just thought, you know, the average South African, the ordinary South African looks at what or listens to what Malema says and thinks, well, this is despicable. Um, so I was a bit surprised with that case. So, but, but now, so get, getting to your question about are we winning and are we being successful? I think the question it's, is what, what exactly do you want to achieve? I can give a good example of this. Um, although I wasn't involved in the litigation itself at that point. But AfriForum were involved in a bunch of um, language cases at universities for a couple of years, basically starting here at around 2010, 2011, where there was a, obviously a lot of pressure at, at universities, it's particularly the, the sort of traditional old Afrikaans universities, you know, UP, the Northwest University, Stellenbosch, um, those places. Although at that point, UJ already completely... Um, uh, uh, you know, changed its, its language policy. So AfriForum was involved in a lot of these cases. And um, the, the point of the litigation at that point, you so, they sort of knew that they're fighting a losing battle, right? In in the end of the day, the, the universities are probably moving in the direction of just having one language of teaching and learning being English. But the goal of the litigation was to stall that process as far as possible for two reasons. The one, to potentially create room for this not to just be a battle between Afrikaans and English, but for it to become a battle of mother tongue education where there are viable other languages at tertiary level where universities can actually adopt those as, as a language of teaching and learning, which we've now seen at, for example, the University of KwaZulu-Natal at UKZN. Um, so, so that was the one goal. And then the second goal was for them is to buy more time to ensure that there are alternatives. And now, 10 years later, they've found it or through their sort of sister organizations, we have academia, where Afrikaans is the language of teaching and learning. So in that sense, I mean, they lost a lot of those cases, right? They lost the case against the University of the Free State in part, Um uh, uh, they won the one against UNISA, uh, coincidentally, but the Stellenbosch fight is sort of still ongoing. And I mean, you suffer a lot of defeats, but the goal isn't necessarily winning the court case. There's sort of a broader goal goal to achieve. And I think if you ask yourself that question, then I would definitely say yes. I think I think a lot of our clients are winning. I think they they're achieving what they want to achieve. Um, they are making South Africa a better place, and I think they are sort of state proofing communities and, and individuals all over South Africa and protecting them. I think the decay would have been much faster had it not been for all these wonderful organizations, uh, you know, putting up a, a really formidable fight. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this discussion, you might want to check out the full length interview with Daniel Eloff. That's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel. That's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.